Welcome everybody to tonight's roundtable discussion. I am Michael Cohen, the Stuart and Suzanne Grant Professor of the American Jewish Experience and Chair and Seisler Professor of the Department of Jewish Studies here at Tulane University. I also direct the Stuart and Suzanne Grant Center for the American Jewish Experience, which launched in July. The center is a world-class hub of Jewish learning dedicated to the innovative and holistic study of American Jews, which wouldn't be here without the generosity of the Grant family and several named and anonymous donors who supported our vision. It's in that capacity that I welcome you to the inaugural public program for the Grant Center. The plan for our center has two major pillars, hiring a world-class faculty and implementing visionary transformative programming. With regard to the first pillar, thanks to the support of our donors, we just completed two national searches, hiring Dr. Alana Horwitz from Stanford University as chair in contemporary American Jewry, and Dr. Golan Moskowitz, who completed his PhD at Brandeis University and who will moderate tonight's program. Today marks the launch of our second strategic pillar, visionary transformative programming. In addition to tonight's discussion, we'll be hosting a Zoom lecture on October 14th, where Dr. Pamela Nadell will be talking about her award-winning book, America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today. And coinciding with the late 2020 release of the new Pew study of American Jewish life, our own Alana Horowitz will be moderating a roundtable discussion with two of the nation's leading experts, Len Sachs of Brandeis and Ari Kelman of Stanford. Date is TBD as the Pew, Re Pew Report release date is still up in the air, but we expect this to be in late November or early December. We're working on student internships and research initiatives, including student faculty research projects and the pending launch of AmericanJewishStudies.org, which will be the digital hub of our field. Later this week, we're also launching a working group on Jewish economic history, where we will virtually convene top scholars from across the world. And trust me, coordinating time zones from LA to New Orleans, to New York, to Oxford, to Jerusalem, and to Cape Town is not an easy thing. We're excited about it. And soon we'll launch a working group on American Jewish literature, where we will offer space and resources to chart a course for this subfield for the next decade. So needless to say, we've been busy. But this week marks a major milestone where we get to see the fruits of all that labor, and you get to see how your support is making an impact on a global level. For more information about who we are and how you can help to support the Grant Center and our vision, please click on the link in the chat, which will bring you to our website. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Golan Moskowitz, who will moderate tonight's panel. Golan Moskowitz, Assistant Professor of Jewish Studies at Tulane, is a literary scholar, cultural historian, and visual artist. He studies modern Jewish childhood, gender, and family memory, memory, and he has written on grandchildren of Holocaust survivors through a gendered lens. He is the author of the forthcoming Wild Visionary, Maurice Sendak in Queer Jewish Context, which will be published by Stanford University Press later this year. It's a really exciting new book. And in the context of tonight's event, Dr. Moskowitz helped to produce the ADL's fabulous new Antisemitism Uncovered, a guide to old myths in a new era. Golan. Thank you, Mike. I wanna first echo your words of thanks. Uh, thank you to the sponsors for this event, for the Grand Center, and also welcome to everyone in attendance. It's really exciting to um, get to moderate the first public facing program for the Grand Center. It's also a privilege to talk to individuals who are leading figures in the study and combating of anti-Semitism today. I'm sure that we're in store, we have a, a really fascinating and timely conversation in store for us. So, as Mike mentioned, this program was conceived in response to a new guide created by ADL, Antisemitism Uncovered, a guide to old myths in a new era. This is a comprehensive resource with historical context, fact-based descriptions of prevalent anti-Semitic myths, contemporary examples, calls to action, and ways of addressing hate. All three of our panelists had a hand in putting this panel together and putting this guide together. And tonight we'll examine the project's conception, its contents, and how it frames the state of anti-Semitism today. So I'll begin by sharing a layout of the event. After I've introduced all three of our distinguished panelists, I'll ask each of them to answer an individually focused question that frames their relationship to anti-Semitism anti Uncovered, the topic of our program. I'll then pose a few questions for all three panelists to answer uh, more conversationally. And then I'll open up for Q&A from the audience. So please do note the chat function at the bottom of the screen. And as questions arise, submit those there. No. So to begin with our introductions, Jonathan Greenblatt is the CEO of the world's leading anti-hate organization, ADL, 
Anti-Defamation League, and its sixth national director. Jonathan has deep experience in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, having worked in the White House serving special, as special assistant to President Barack Obama and director of the Office of Social Innovation before joining ADL. Jonathan DeSarna is university professor and Joseph H. and Bell R. Braun professor of American Jewish history at Brandeis University, where he directs the Schusterman Center for, the, for Israel Studies. He also chairs the academic advisory and editorial board of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati and serves as chief historian of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. Dr. Sarna is the author or editor of more than 30 books on American Jewish history and life, including American Judaism, A History, published by Yale in 2004, with a second edition released last June. And you can actually see an image of that second edition behind Dr. Sarna. Magda Tedder is professor of history and the Schwindler Chair of Judaic Studies at Fordham University. She's a fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research and author of several books, including most recently, Blood Libel on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth, published by Harvard this year. Dr. Tedder is this year's NEH Senior Scholar at the Center for Jewish History. So now I'll go ahead and pose the first broad question for Jonathan Greenblatt. For those not yet familiar, could you tell us a little bit about Antisemitism Uncovered, A Guide to Old Myths in a New Era, the resource that ADL released in March? How was it conceived and why was it conceived now? How should we think about it in light of recent ADL data on American antisemitism? Thank you so much, Golan, for that, uh, for that lovely kind of introduction, if you will. Um, what I'd love to do to answer the question would actually be to share some slides, if I might. So I'm gonna open up the share screen right now. Semitism Uncovered is the product of a year and a half of research. And I just wanna acknowledge up front that I had the great pleasure of working on this project with some of the leading thinkers in the field. I'm humbled that what we've done here is the result of their input and their wisdom, including Professor Sarna and Professor Teeter, who are two giants in the field, and also Golan Yu who are intimately involved as well. So I'm, I have deep gratitude to everyone on this call. So we released Antisemitism Uncovered earlier this year, and you can find it online at antisemitism.adl.org because we felt like it was useful to realize that we're operating in a moment right now where antisemitism, unfortunately, has been on the rise. So we've seen an unprecedented surge here in the US, where in 2019, we literally had more antisemitic incidents in America that at any point that the ADL has seen in 40 years of tracking this data. So literally over four decades, last year had more acts of harassment, vandalism and violence than we've ever seen. And that was coming, if you look at the chart, as you can see here, we've seen a spike essentially arise since the year 2016. Prior to that, we had an almost 15 year decline. But in 2016, the number rose 34% much of which was weighted toward the second half of the year, and it took place around the presidential election when anti-Semitic memes and myths seemed to be exploding on social media. In 2017, the year of Charlottesville, there was a 57% year-over-year increase. In 2019, while the number dipped slightly nationwide, 2018 brought us the most violent act, anti-Semitic act in American history, the attack in Pittsburgh, and then, of course, last year, as I said, the highest number we've ever seen. And I should just say, while the incidents are higher here, the attitudes are of concern around the world. To think, as we move into this 21st century, that 25% of Europeans still hold what we would call classic anti-Semitic stereotypes. You know, those people who still live on the blood-soaked land that is modern Europe, in the shadow of the Holocaust, they still cling to some of these terrible old myths. So what are these myths? Well, what we tried to do in Antisemitism Uncovered was provide a bit of context for the public to try to make sense of what these issues are. Myths about Jewish power, that Jews are manipulating events from behind the scenes. And what we did was drawing from text, drawing from history to explain how these myths have persisted over time, and then providing examples in our contemporary context, such as the myth of Jewish control that George Soros is manipulating, you know, 
the military and people on the left, like David Petraeus, or on the right, like H.R. McMaster, both former national security advisors, that he himself is being manipulated by the Rothschilds, or that the Jews are responsible for capitalism as exemplified by the American flag or communism as exemplified in Bolshevism by the, by the former Soviet Union flag. Disloyalty, the idea that Jews are not loyal to the countries in which they live. And I think this classic image here <clears throat> of Dreyfus, and many people know about the Dreyfus affair, and Professor Sarn I think has written about that at length, uh, could speak to that. But this idea that Jews are disloyal has trailed the Jewish people for millennia in exile myths of Jewish greed. And what are the roots of the myths? So we know from history, again, and we make, we spell this out in anti-Semitism Uncovered, about how Jews were forced to be money lenders in medieval Europe because the church would not allow Christians to hold that job. And then Jews were stereotyped and persecuted because they lent money. And that again, not only has that myth persisted, and again, you can see the use of different flags to symbolize, you know, the Jews responsible for financiers for World War I in this case. Right, but it's transcended time as well. The myth of deicide, that Jews are collectively responsible for the death of Christ. This has been a myth that's persisted literally for two, for, for millennia since uh, at the hands of the Roman Empire. The myth of the blood libel that comes out of the, the story of William of Norwich at the turn of the first millennium, that the Jews are responsible for kidnapping a baby and using it for some ritual sacrifice. Today, that still persists today, and even if this picture, you know, has the emblem of the Mossad and the idea that the Jews are trying to murder Palestinians to steal their organs, the roots of this attack and this kind of insidious criticism are, go back a thousand years. Roots of denialism, and we see that with the Holocaust, as was so often the case throughout history when Jews persecu Jewish persecution was denied, <clears throat> and finally delegitimization. Whether you're saying the Jews themselves are not a real people, or that the Jewish state is not a real nation, that the Jews shouldn't have rights, or relegating Jew, only Jewish, only Israel, trying to say that it's a Nazi country, as if it was just one of a number of Zionism, that Jews don't have the same right as everyone else. Delegitimizing the Jewish people, or delegitimizing the Jewish state, holding us to double standards, all classic symbols of um, anti-Semitism. So I tried to run through that very quickly, Golan, I'm happy to talk at greater length about the resource, uh, if that's helpful in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was really helpful to ground us in the structure and the genesis of the, of the guide. And, and I think that'll hopefully prompt some interesting questions from the audience as we explore the myths. Great. So the next question I have is for Jonathan Sarna. Uh, so Dr. Sarna, I wonder if you would help listeners contextualize the current moment in American Jewish history regarding anti-Semitism. How are leading scholars of American Jewish life thinking about the recent visibility <coughs> of anti-Semitism uh, within historical context? Sure, and, and thank you. And let me say what a pleasure it is to uh, be here and take this opportunity to congratulate everyone involved in the creation of the Grant Center. It's going to make, a, I think, a tremendous difference uh, in our field. Um, I think we can see a large generation gap in the way recent events have been seen. For young people, it was a complete surprise to see anti-Semitism. After all, there hadn't been much talk about contemporary anti-Semitism since the 1990s. Uh, they hadn't heard about it. What they had heard is that American Jews had become, in the title of a famous book, white folks. And they had come to believe that anti-Semitism had ended. There actually was a book with the title, The End of American Anti-Semitism. My, my friend uh, Jonathan here would have been out of a job. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a very widespread sense that in America, if you have white skin, you're safe, nothing to worry about. 
uh, hostility is only against people of color. And a lot of young American Jews also believed that. And then came Charlottesville. And they were told, Jews will not replace us. They hardly understood what that meant. Uh, and of course, from there, we went to Pittsburgh and Poway and so many other uh, incidents as uh, Jonathan has shown us. Young people were astonished. And I'm so happy we have this book because there hasn't been much scholarship on American anti-Semitism since the 1990s. There's no new history of American anti-Semitism. For older folks, more senior scholars and uh, folks with longer historical memories, I don't think it was so surprising. After all, uh, we had quite a lot of anti-Semitism in their memory. Um, and this to them, uh, and I include myself in that latter group, um, I really fit a pattern indeed in my own uh, thinking and my own teaching. I've gone back to a classic article that the great American historian John Hyam uh, wrote way back in 1957. Uh, I think the ADL actually assisted him in some of his groundbreaking um, research. And some of the ideas that he set forth then are no less important today. So for example, he said, anti-Semitism through the history of the United States is cyclical. It's not continuous, it goes up, it goes down. Anyone who looks at the chart um, in anti-Semitism uncovered knows that that's the case. Um, and um, uh, that explains its reemergence. It's not a linear history, it's not a straight line continuous history, uh, it's cyclical. Um, Hayam reminded us, for a lot of people, there is ambivalence toward Jews. Diverse, conflicting, pro, anti ideas. They say different things at different times. Um, and that's still true. Um, he showed us how much anti Semitism relates to larger social problems mass migration, economic dislocation displacement of elites. All of that explains what's going on today. Uh, he explained how nationalism tends to fuel anti-Semitism, uh, which is certainly uh, the case today. The blaming of outsiders for various problems and, of course, the idea the Jews are outsiders. Uh, he noted that in the history of American anti-Semitism, you frequently have very different groups who all share a common hatred of Jews. For example, in the late 19th century, it was patrician intellectuals, poor urban masses, and populist agrarian rebels. Those three groups had nothing in common except they all blamed their problems on the Jews. Today, we simply have three totally different groups, um, uh, the extreme left, the extreme right, and Islamist groups. They don't have anything in common except that all three are certain that their problems caused by the Jews. They have common fantasies, or in terms of, of anti-Semitism uncovered, they believe these myths. They are persuaded by the myths, even though um, they, they do not share those three, uh, each other's other views. 
Um, and finally, uh, John Heim remind us, reminded us that um, it never ends with the Jews, that anti-Semitism is really best viewed in comparative perspective as one of a variety of hatreds. It goes along uh, with nativism or with anti-Asian sentiments or with other forms of hatred. That has been true in American history throughout. So for those with long memories, what we are seeing now reminds us of earlier moments, unhappy moments in many cases, in America's past. Um, I think for young people, it was a complete uh, revelation. Um, but my hope is that with the help of this book and other works, uh, we will begin to view uh, the contemporary situation within its proper historical context uh, as a reminder, yeah, we've seen a lot of this before, and uh, we know quite a lot about how anti-Semitism uh, in America works. Um, and um, we can learn from that and apply it to our day. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Sarna. Um, I have to say, having been a grad student in your course, the, the Hayam uh, ideas are some of the ones that have stuck with me the most and informed some of my own teaching. So that's, it's great to hear you uh, reiterate mm -hmm. those and to, to think about the generational differences in memory and maybe surprise around anti-Semitism, as well as the repeated themes of uh, scapegoating across diverse groups who happen to blame the Jews um, as a repeated theme through history. So the the next uh, question I have for Magda Tedder, Dr. Tedder, your work um, examines other contexts, other historical periods, um, and other geographic regions. Your book specifically deals with blood libel in medieval Europe. So a question I have for you is about the possibilities or limitations of comparative perspectives when looking at contemporary anti-Semitism. Broadly speaking, are there specific connections or differences that you think we need to understand? between American anti-Semitism in the present and other forms of anti-Semitism from other contexts, other eras or geographic regions, or potentially conflations that we need to avoid. Yeah, so uh, when, I, uh, when I started working on this book years ago, it was a very different context and I thought it was going to be you know, just a research project, as many research projects there are. And as I find myself thinking about this project, I find my, uh, myself in a twilight zone of saying that, well, my book is relevant, even though it deals with Europe, mostly Europe before 1800. It starts the book, uh, the core of the book deals with medieval and what we historians call, call early modern Europe, um, the, the 15th through the 18th century. But as I start, um, I start with actually an incident that was prompted by, the, uh, by an action uh, by the ADL of forcing Facebook to shut down a site called the Jewish Ritual Murder. And uh, as I was uh, finishing the, the book in 2017, uh, again, I was very much aware of what Jonathan Greenblatt showed us, the rise of incidents, uh, anti-Semitic incidents. And literally when my book was going into, uh, it, it was in press and we were, I, I was just um, having the last final touches, the um, Poe synagogue shooting in San Diego happened. And, uh, and what does the shooter uh, write in his online manifesto, he uh, refers to Simon of Trent. You are not forgotten, Simon of Trent. The horror that you and countless children have endured at the hands of the Jews will never be forgiven. So this 2019 uh, white supremacist shooter in California is referring to a character that is a very important character in my book. A, a, a toddler whose body was found on Easter uh, during the Easter week um, in 1475 in Northern Italy. So my book is very much sadly 
relevant to what is happening in America. And what it reveals is it doesn't just recount these stories, but it explains how they become rooted in the European Christian imagination and by extension also in then American, especially Christian white supremacist imagination. Uh, so it, 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 um, it shows the, um, how rumors and fa uh, fake news, really, fake stories become facts. Uh, and though some of these tales emerged in the medieval period, they really became rooted in the Christian imagination in the early modern period, thanks to the new technology of print. So you have this new media, mass media, that is reproducing these stories very much akin to what we are witnessing now with the new media that is replicating at much faster rate uh, lies, means, and, uh, and anti-Semitic tropes is, is through uh, is social, uh, social media. So, um, so I think um, the, the book is very much relevant, even though it may deal with Europe and even it may, though it may deal with, the, um, uh, with centuries ago, because it explains the mechanisms of how things are transmitted. Since the 13th century, everybody knew Jews didn't do this kind of thing. They didn't kill Christian children for blood. The popes condemned it, the emperors condemned it, kings condemned it. At many, many times Jews were acquitted, it was known. And yet, despite the rational arguments, despite arguments against it, this story continued to be repeated. So the book explains why people don't believe in facts why people don't accept the truth, why people uh, embrace the untruths that they find. So that's what really the, the larger argument and the larger story of that is, uh, of that, that, that book that spans um, eight centuries. Thank you so much. So definitely um, in a disheartening way, but um, I'm, I'm excited for your, your book's success this, you know, some really relevant <laughs> contemporary issues, um, thinking about fake news and social media um, in interesting ways aligning with the, you know, the growth of the printing press and the spread of certain ideas. Uh, and images too. And that's a very important aspect in the ADL uh, uh, resource, the visual culture. And that's again, is spread through the printing press before the invention of the printing press, images were localized, stories were localized, but they became mass produced in, uh, uh, thanks to the new technology, media technology. Great, thank you so much. And of course, we're in a very um, visual moment of our culture today. So of course we can apply uh, some similarities there. Uh, so the next portion of our program, I'd like to open up to more of a conversational format. Um, I'll, I'll pose, a question, uh, I have a few questions, and I'll pose the first for all three panelists to answer, um, however you see fit, uh, who would ever like to speak first. The question that I have is about obstacles. So what are the greatest obstacles that you perceive right now uh, in terms of America understanding and combating anti-Semitism today? And how does a resource like Anti-Semitism Uncovered potentially work against those obstacles? Well, I'd be happy to start and then hand it off to, to Magda and Jonathan. So I think one of the biggest, I would, I think there are a few obstacles and I'll just go through them quickly. Number one, I think we live in a charged moment where everything from literally the weather reports to scientific data, like literally not just the opinion pieces, but the empirical information has become politicized. And indeed, we shouldn't be surprised that anti-Semitism has become a partisan tool. And yet, whether it's coming from the left or the right, when charges of anti-Semitism become sort of a political cudgel for one side to use against the other, the people who lose in the middle are the Jewish people. Because our, this prejudice becomes just yet another data point in a campaign commercial or yet another kind of claim to be used against your political opponent, it reduces the outrage and again, renders it a political tool. So I think that number one is a problem. I think the second thing that's a problem, and you know, Jonathan alluded to this, 
Like we're living in a moment of racial reckoning in this country. We're living in a moment where Asian Americans have been the victims of kind of harassment due to COVID related claims that is really ugly. <clears throat> we're living in a moment, still in the shadow of the Me Too movement, et cetera. And so many people feel like, you know, as Jonathan sort of said, anti-Semitism, is it really a problem? Is it really an issue? Aren't Jews white? Aren't they privileged? Haven't they succeeded in so many fields? The Jews that I know, they're doing so well. I've heard this again and again. Despite the data that I showed you at the start of this, despite the fact that last year we had a mass shooting by a white supremacist in Southern California, a stabbing by a deranged person in uh, Muncie, New York, a shooting at a kosher supermarket by a black Hebrew Israelite, three people killed in New Jersey, and assaults on a daily basis on the streets of Brooklyn, people still say, but yeah, but those Jews, is it really a problem or are Jews part of the problem because of the elite? So in an anti-elite world, in a moment when there are really big issues we're wrestling with, anti-Semitism often gets diminished or subordinated. And then the third, but I will just say, like, we need to have the dimensionality to think on multiple levels at the same time, right? Different things can be true at once. Yes, systemic racism is a problem. Yes, Asian harassment is a problem. And yes, anti-Semitism remains a problem. Finally, I think something else that Magna just alluded to, I'll just draw out a little bit, which is the ubiquity of social media. Social media has reconfigured society. The way we socialize, the way we shop, the way we, the way we uh, gather all our information, the way we live our lives. And in the face of that, the thing that's so different is anti-Semitism has been able to flourish on this platform in a way that defies what you see in other forms of media. Now look, media has often, new media has often been weaponized by bigots. Charles Coughlin used the radio in the 1930s to diminish Jews. Henry Ford used the printing press um, you know, and pamphlets in a way, if you will, to diminish Jews when he published The International Jew and again, also the first half of this 20th century. And talk, I can give you more examples. Public access, television in the early days of cable TV was a problem. Mm -hmm. But because of the way the law works and the, li the, li the liability laws around user-generated content, which exempt the platforms from the li liability laws that govern all traditional media from outdoor to print, to broadcast, to radio, et cetera, Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and so on have literally become cesspools of anti-Jewish hate. And until the companies take stronger action, because it's a bit of, we play a lot of whack-a-mole with the ADL, and I can go into greater length. I mean, literally, we opened a center in Silicon Valley in 2017. We've hired, literally, the guy who runs it's a software engineer. I have data scientists. I have, you know, coders doing AI and machine learning to build new tools to neutralize this issue, to measure and neutralize it. But it's hard to keep up because the volume is so great. So social media and the legal environment in which it flourishes creates a continuous flow of anti-Semitism, which is also very difficult to handle. So social media, um, the current kind of moment of, of, of uh, unrest and the politicization of, of the anti-Jewish hate, all I think are complicating factors and obstacles to solving it. Yeah, and I, I would also add leadership. Um, you know, one of the points that I make in my book is that leadership matters and public statements of condemnation matter, even though they are not effective, but they matter. And what we, what we see is that we have amplification of some of these anti-Semitic tropes through figures of authority, through if, not just marginal uh, figures, but th uh, figures who have uh, social stature and respect. And at the same time, we also uh, see, uh, see or hear silences in terms of the condemnation of, of, that, of those, uh, those anti-Semitic. So I would, I would definitely add at uh, the lack of leadership and courage to, uh, to respond to anti-Semitism by other uh, public, uh, public figures. That's you know, one of other, other the, the great historian Shulamit Volkov argued in a totally different context that anti-Semitism is a cultural code. What she meant is it doesn't tell us about Jews. It tells us 
about the culture. Read Henry Ford, you won't recognize the Jews he writes about. He blamed Jews for everything that he did not like about uh, what was going on in America of his day, which was a very fast changing America. In the same way, uh, when one reads uh, contemporary anti-Semitica, it doesn't tell you anything about Jews, but they impose on Jews. They blame Jews for a lot of the changes that are going on in America today. It's a code. When you decode it, you see that you're simply trying to find uh, some easy scapegoat for the massive changes going on in American society, whether uh, these are changes connected with the makeup of America itself, uh, new religions, new kinds of immigrants, um, a very significant migratory um, uh, transformations, um, as well as changes brought on by digitization. When we look back, the digital revolution will be no less important than the revolution of printing. And just as printing, as was pointed out, was misused to uh, disseminate anti-Semitism uh, in much greater volume um, and in new ways. Uh, so the digital revolution uh, is being misused uh, to disseminate hate. And um, uh, I think it's important to recognize it. Now, the second half of your question was, will uh, anti-Semitism uncovered overcome that? I hope Jonathan will forgive me. I certainly don't imagine every anti-Semite, every white nationalist will read it and be instantly transformed. I don't think that was the point. I think there are a lot of Americans who haven't thought about this issue. They hardly recognized it as an issue. They wondered, my, my neighbor is Jewish, a wonderful person. And, and, and they read about all of these incidents and they, they're simply looking for answers. And anti-Semitism uncovered, it seems to me, is wonderful for those people. I do not think that it, um, uh, for a minute, will transform the haters in our midst, uh, who generally hate Jews for lots of other reasons and are, are not, um, I think, subject to simply uh, being persuaded by any kind of book. But let's remember, there still are uh, a huge number uh, of, of Americans who can benefit from uh, this kind of uh, lesson about what anti-Semitism was and what it is today. I, I have... I Go ahead. I'm sorry, Magda, you go no, first. No, that's okay, it's okay. Go ahead. I was gonna say, I mean, I think Jonathan, Jonathan makes an important point, Golan, that's worth drawing out. Like we didn't develop anti-Semitism uncovered to convince the white supremacists. Why we developed it was, you know, the, 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 a candidate Trump tweeted out a picture of Hillary Clinton with a Jewish star and people said, what's anti-Semitic about that? Or Ilhan Omar said, you know, it's all about the 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 Benjamins. Say, Benjamin. it's all about the Benjamins. The Benjamins. Yeah. The Benjamins. And people said, "But what's anti-Semitic about that?" And I people said, "Israel is an illegal colonial state that doesn't have the right to exist." And I'm Jewish, and people would say, "Well, so what's anti-Semitic about that?" So we did this to kind of try to make the point without getting into politics. Here are the roots. Here are why those claims today have been so troublesome over time. Here are the roots of those kinds of spurious charges, right? And again, by taking the politics out, we wanted to get the, get, put the principles in. So everyone was clear on, on why this, no matter who says it, the president, a member of Congress, uh, a public figure from, from Hollywood or, or from uh, the football field, 
all of it is um is bad news. Yeah, Sorry, I, no, no, no. It's 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 it's, it's that's right. Uh, but you know, my it, it's interesting because I as I I was go uh, preparing for tonight, I went through the. Uh, the website and one of the striking thing is that I said, oh, they're trying to trick the white supremacists because when you see it, it repeats the the, the trope, Jews are greedy. Jew, uh, greedy, Jews kill Christian children for blood or something like that. And 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 then I'm I'm reading and of course, as, especially in the section that I'm familiar with, it's the same like, no, Jews don't do it. They con don't consume blood. This, and these are the arguments that I've seen since the 13th century and they don't stick, right? They didn't stick for so many centuries. So I, I have to say my long history, uh, being a historian of the long time ago, I am quite pessimistic about it. Uh, I am pessimistic about, um, how we can combat this kind of, I think this kind of prejudice, um, it, it really is a, a kind of a retail work uh, and a long-term work. And, and I, I, I applaud the effort of, of outlining these, uh, these uh, but I'm also worried about the repetition of the language and uh, of, of the, of the anti-Semitic stereotypes that may, you know, people may not read to paragraph four, but they will uh, will see some of those uh, some of those headlines, and uh, and I also noticed that in the effort to combat anti-Semitism in the uh, responses to the shootings or attacks, um, journalists often tend to recount other attacks and anti-Semitism. And, and, I, and I was struck by the very kind of limited vocabulary of reporting about Jews that makes them, uh, you know, uh, being attacked all the time as if there was no other possibility of interaction with, with, with Jews in that kind of way. And I think that's also dangerous. We need to develop a sort of more complex tools. And I know, Jonathan, it's so difficult and I don't know how to do it. You know, do do we scan and put on Twitter this is anti-Semitic right away and link to your website? Well, How do we yeah. uh, combat that by without reinforcing the the stereotype? I, at the table? I have to say it's hard. I mean, one of the you know, oftentimes when I present this information, I have to warn the audience. Uh, some of these images may disturb you, and I and I and there is a certain degree of ten, internal tension because to Magda's point, I, we're we're putting out images that the anti-Semites love. And they get a little bit of oxygen when we elevate them, even if it is to make a point. I don't know, Magda, I, I, or I'm open to suggestions. I think it's an imprecise process, but we yeah. feel like sunlight is the best disinfectant. Let's get these out there, and then we yeah. can dispel the myths one by one by one yeah. by one. Yeah, it's tough. A really difficult question, but some interesting ideas circulating that I hope are um, maybe going to inform more of the conversation to come. So. I'm going to skip ahead to a question uh, that, that uh, draws on something that was referenced earlier, which is this moment of American reckoning with anti-racism. Um, so we're living through a period in which America's asked to reckon with the deep roots of systemic racism that have marked its history, especially for Black Americans. Um, and as protesters and organizers strive to empower Blackness, Jewishness as a whole is sometimes subsumed into perceptions of whiteness. And though many Jews do and have benefited from white privilege, this conflation of Jews and whiteness across the board uh, might, be said, might be said to erase experiences of black Jews, Jews of color, and also um, ways in which even white Jews might be targeted themselves as Jews in America, as we know. Um, and yet, perhaps because of the popular conception that Jews are mostly white, as some might say, Confronting anti-Semitism uh, sometimes is perceived as detracting focus from larger goals of anti-racism. So with these statements in mind, how in your opinion do we fight anti-Semitism in ways that coalesce with anti-racist efforts uh, rather than compete with those efforts? Look, I think that as far back as we can go in terms of fighting anti-Semitism, uh, you know, people like, say, Louis Marshall at the beginning of the 20th century 
uh, who was, I used to say, American jury ran under martial law. He was a great lawyer. He was one of the great American Jewish leaders of his time. He understood perfectly well that these different forms of hatred were interrelated. And one of the reasons that he was so very active in the NAACP, basically chaired their legal committee and helped to design their legal strategy was his sense that uh, if we could help solve the problem of African Americans, we would make life better for Jewish Americans, that these forms of hatred are interrelated. Uh, John Hyam, whom I mentioned earlier, used to speak of the 1920s as the tribal 20s, because he understood, yes, terrible anti-Semitism, that of course is the era of Henry Ford, but it's also the era of the Klan, of the Ku Klux Klan, it's an era of very significant uh, anti-Catholicism and of other forms of hatred as well. I mentioned all of this to make the point that one of the saddest, I think, developments of our day is that there is an effort to somehow marginalize anti-Semitism. Oh, it's not like racism or, or other forms of hatred. Nothing could be more mistaken. These are all inter- connected and recognizing uh, that they are interconnected, uh, I, I think is um, a really absolutely necessary. And I, I myself refuse to play the game as this hatred worse than that hatred. Um, have you been persecuted more than I've been persecuted? That's clearly not the point. Uh, the point is really to reinforce a sense of what America at its best stands for. We've not always looked up to what America at its best stands for, but what America at its best stands for, and all of us together uh, work to achieve that and to condemn all of the various kinds uh, of hatred that we see around us today and that in many cases uh, have uh, existed uh, up and down through the length and breadth of American history. I'd like to explain. Um, my answer may be a little bit different than uh, Jonathan. First of all, we need to acknowledge that the vast majority of Jews in the United States are of Ashkenazi uh, descent, you know, of European descent. And we show up as white people. That is, now I may be slightly darker complexion than some other people, but the reality is the large number of Jews who've been in this country for generations present as white. That's just true. Now, and the way that the social construct that is race works, whereas Jews were once considered not white the turn, at the start of the 20th century, today we are considered white. And to put us in a room next to a person of color, most Ashkenazi Jews look white. That's just true. And so an environment where being a person of color may lead to someone following you when you walk into the drugstore to make sure you don't shoplift, may lead you to get pulled over by the police for the crime of driving while black, may lead you to get pulled over in the passport line um, at the airport because you look funny or your name seems funny and so on and so forth. Most American Jews have a kind of privilege today that others, some, that, that people of color don't have. That is a reality. It's also true that uh, we live in a multiracial world, a multiracial country, and a multiracial Jewish community. There are Jews of color who might identify as Black Americans, who might identify as Latinx or come be immigrants themselves from Latin America, from Central or South America, who may be immigrants from the Middle East, or Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, and who might not present as white. This is also reality. And in a world in which our community, that Ashkenazi Jewish community 
is increasingly assimilated and intermarried into the into the multiracial Jew, multiracial world and the multi you know national Jewish world. We shouldn't be surprised that Jews live between these spaces too. And I would say in this moment of racial reckoning, Jews of color face particularly difficult circumstances. And I know I've seen this, where I've seen black Jews, if you will, people who are black Americans who are Jewish, questioned when they walk into a synagogue, what are you doing here? I mean, I'm sure many people on this Zoom have seen that, where they're questioned in a way that white Jews just aren't. So must say, there's not a lot of instance of crime on Saturday mornings in the synagogue. I mean, those sorts of questions raise real issues about, again, the persistent prevalence of cultural racism that, that does exist whether we like it or not. The last thing I'll just say, I don't think it is, as a white, a white identifying American Jew, sure, anti-Semitism is, is a problem, but I believe racism is my problem too. And I hope the black Americans see that sure, racism is their problem, but anti-Semitism is their problem too. ADL was founded on the principle that Jews could never be free in this country unless everyone was free. And until everyone was safe and secure, so Jews would not be safe and secure. That's, a, that's an ancient Jewish idea, and it's a modern Jewish imperative. And that's why we do the work that we do today more than ever in this moment. And I will just add that I think above all, we need honesty, like a really openness and honesty about this conversation and acknowledge that groups that have been victims of bigotry, prejudice and hatred may harbor hatred and prejudice themselves. Right. And that's what you were just talking about and and have that sort of very patient conversation about anti-black racism within white America, including uh, Ashkenazi Jewish society and anti-Semitism in other parts of society, including among some um, uh, some uh, minority groups, people of uh, of color, uh, black or Latinx, and or, or or others, and and it it is very difficult to do it in this era of 140 Twitter characters and headline news that people don't really go in depth in this and and it really is a process, but I will say that there is a historical precedent of what can, it's not all doom and gloom, um, but there is a way to approach it. Again, it's a very lengthy process and it needs investment, but it's the rapprochement between the Jewish community and the Catholic church after centuries of, of hor horrible history. And it's not the perfect relationship, but it did bring honest dialogue, openness to and making them, themselves, the participants making themselves vulnerable to aspects of their own past and of their own cultures that are maybe not something that they are willing to face made that process, made, made that process possible. So that openness, honesty to dialogue, not feeling defensive about aspects that are, you know, there's no ideal, ideal society. There is a bigotry in every one of, uh, of us. So, so that's what I would just add. Yeah, I wanna jump on, if I may, on Magda's point, because it's so important and relevant really to the work of the Grant Center. It's worth looking at, um, the transformation of Catholic Jewish relations in the United States, where I live in Boston. When I started, I once did a book on the Jews of Boston. Every Boston Jew remembered fighting with Catholics and fighting over turf. And uh, today, um, we have a bridge named for the head of the ADL in, uh, in Boston who built bridges. And my students are a astonished to hear about what Catholic Jewish relations once were in, in the United States. There are other such examples. I think uh, people are astonished at the degree to which Mormons were persecuted in the 19th century, literally chased out of the country. Uh, I think there's been, uh, to take a very recent example, a big change in the perception of 
LBG uh, individuals, one of the fastest social movements in America, um, uh, has really been uh, the transformation of, um, uh, of attitudes. And there is much that can be learned uh, from all of that. Uh, when one looks, um, uh, one sees that the early folks, the early Catholics and Jews in America who sat down together were reviled by both groups, and yet they planted seeds, and we are the beneficiaries of the fruit of their much maligned efforts. And so there, there are all sorts of opportunities, I think, to look at successful uh, social change. Um, it doesn't mean it will last forever, uh, but I, I think amidst the gloom and doom, it is worth remembering some of the great transformations that have taken place. Yeah, and I think that's exactly one of the important tools in the combat uh, of anti-Semitism and bigotry and, and hatred is to actually provide tools of people who are pushing back, uh, who are, uh, so they're, they're models to, to, uh, to, uh, on, upon which to, 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 to look to. And, and if we are just recounting these examples of hatred, this is not going to give us much to to work with and uh, and I, I have to say that that I, I teach now at a Catholic University Fordham University is a Jesuit University I teach a class on the history of anti-semitism and I'm really delighted to see that the decades of of the dialogue between the Jewish community and the Catholic Church has worked because students are shocked at why would they hate you so much? You know, what was it? And that is the success, but that's a slow success. That, that's the dialogue that's influencing how things are taught in schools. That's pushing back. That's the sort of nudging, you know, both sides in this, in this and that's, 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 a, that's a lengthy process and, and change doesn't come, you know, over, overnight. So that's, yeah. Thank you so much. These are some really nuanced comments about you know, the complexity that we all need to hold. Um, so another topic that I wanna pose before I open up for audience questions is um, related to COVID-19 and universities and campuses. Um, so many of us are learning and teaching remotely now in this era of social distancing. Have you observed or do you predict any changes in the uh, existence of anti-Semitism on college and university campuses? Uh, and a related question, could you maybe comment further on the connection in rhetoric about public health uh, linking the virus with anti-Semitic discourse for those unfamiliar? You're Jonathan, muted. you have to unmute. Apologies. So <laughs> I can start here. You know, at ADL, we're tracking anti-Semitic incidents as well as anti-Semitic attitudes. And again, as I, as I alluded to earlier, we also monitor very extensively uh, what is happening on social media. We have certainly seen vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 a, a, a surge of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and images and memes on social media with accusations that the Jews either A, started the virus, that somehow this was a bioweapon formulated by Israel, literally, or Jews in a lab, that B, Jews were singularly responsible for spreading the virus. Some of the early reports of hotspots in the US being at the APAC policy conference last March in Washington, DC, or at a, high, a, very, uh, a community with a large Jewish population outside in Westchester County, New York, outside New York City, or even tying it to a specific, you know, there was a simcha, well, wedding uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a conservative synagogue in that community. So there were reports that seemed to go on at great lengths about the fact that it happened there or that Orthodox communities were somehow uniquely defying it. I will, I will long remember when Mayor de Blasio felt compelled one night, our, our mayor here in New York, to uh, single-handedly single single -handedly leave his home at 11 o'clock at night donning a windbreaker to break up a, an Orthodox uh, wedding party 
that was not complying with the social distancing norms when he himself had been at Central Park a few days earlier, not complying with the social distancing norm. The irony that wasn't lost on anyone. So this idea that Jews are somehow singularly spreading the virus, and thirdly, that Jews are somehow profiting from the virus. So some of the reports out of Israel about the pharma industry really focusing on developing a vaccine, or big pharma companies here in the United States, some of whom may have executives who are Jewish. And there were lots of stories about that Jews were somehow trying to profit from the virus. I mean, again, all of this invokes some of the myths that I mentioned earlier in terms of these longstanding tropes used against Jews, blood libel, you know, greedy, manipulate, you know, power and manipulation. It's quite ugly. Um, I would say, as I mentioned in passing before, we have seen uh, people from the Asian American community, particularly those who are perceived to be Chinese, really being victimized in ways that are ugly and, and, and awful and wrong. But there's been, a, you know, the, the white supremacists and the ardent, whether again, the ardent people coming from the extreme white, like rights of presidents, or the ardent people coming from the radical left and some hardcore anti-Zionists have found a way to use this to blame the Jewish people or the Jewish state for COVID-19. And it's, it's all quite, quite ugly and unfortunate. So I, I think it's worth remembering that anti-Semites knew Jews were to blame for the plague of COVID-19 before COVID-19 existed. Meaning, to their mind, Jews are always to blame. Um, and it anti-Semitism kind of offers them a ready-made explanation that can be applied um, uh, to uh, economic downturns, to uh, plagues, to any ill that exists. So we, we do need to remember that. But I come again to the reason we need university centers uh, that study this material. And the answer is, it's complicated to understand a plague. Um, it's, uh, we need people to realize that complexity is something you embrace and live with rather than conspiracy theories, oh, I can pin it, uh, the blame on X or Y. Uh, we would at least like to imagine that those who have studied, uh, who both have studied the past and uh, have studied in a rigorous fashion, uh, are able to embrace complexity uh, more. Uh, and um, uh, the, the truth is, the idea that uh, Jews are the cause of plagues, that's as old as blood libels, as the Magda knows, the Black Death and the like. Uh, not a surprise to me that those tropes have come back, uh, but, uh, a, you know, a reminder uh, of, of why the educational process can never end, and uh, that uh, we should be wary of simple explanations. Right, and I and I also want to return to, again to the to the point I made about about the way we talk about Jews. So, and uh, immediately when these uh, examples, Jonathan, that you, Jonathan Greenblatt, that you brought up, uh, so we've seen in press and Jewish uh, Jewish press and also in general uh, journalism a sort of pushback and saying exactly as Jonathan Sana said, oh, Jews have always been blamed for this. Look, Black Death and this, and then recounting this without really grounding it any explanation and then people I am imagine myself to, uh, as, a, as a person who knows nothing about Jews and is not interested about Jews and said oh Jews are always blamed for this disease maybe there's something about Jews so by pushing back by only repeating that oh Jews have always been blamed Jews has always been attacked Jews have always those people who don't know anything that there's there is much more to Jewish history than that, will think, well, why? And then they will go online. And I did that exercise uh, in a, like a, a cookie cleared uh, browser. And I said, why are Jews hated? 
And what came up is exactly reification of, of, of anti-Semitic tropes. And that is a problem. That is a very dangerous way. So again, as we are, you know, looking at pushing back, we need to, we need to be more nimble about it. We cannot just go, you know, Wikipedia and say, oh, Jews were blamed for the plague and repeat all those and they were burned and they were attacked and this, because then it becomes a model how you deal with Jews in crisis, that they are burned, attacked and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I really, I, I think we need to, we need to be, uh, be careful about how we are pushing back against this and how we're, so we are not replicating and reinforcing these anti-Semitic tropes. Great. That's a really delicate balance that you're referring to that I think about um, in terms of the representation of, uh, you know, which frameworks are we presenting in terms of how Jews have existed and can exist in the future in the world. Um, the... Uh, the, the other part of that question was about campus culture or campus anti-Semitism. Uh, in the, in the era of um, yeah. COVID-19, are there any thoughts? I, I forgive me for not answering that. So we have certainly seen a dip in anti anti-Semitic activity on campus in the last six months. I think the the closure of campuses, the shift from live events to virtual events, a number of these things have changed the dynamic that's often so palpable in the physical world. You know, the Israel apartheid week seemed to have been canceled, and maybe it happened virtually in some places. I don't know. But many of the things that are typically on our radar came down at the end of the last academic year. We did see some new threats like Zoom bombing, where Jewish events from lectures to, you know, Hebrew school classes to Torah study sessions were Zoom bombed or interrupted by extremists and trolls. That has diminished as the company uh, Zoom has implied more security protocols to make the meetings more difficult to penetrate. As we head into the coming school year, to the extent that we have a hybrid situation where many classes take place online versus sort of on campus, I would anticipate that the anti-Semitism will continue to diminish, although again, it may mutate and take new forms, but like Zoom bombing or other virtual threats. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so I think at this point, we want to open up for audience Q&A. Uh, so we have a lot of great questions already collected. And one question kind of uh, dovetails with this, asking about academia and facticity. So we have a question about how um, the current unrest and lack of leadership and disregard for uh, facts or empirical data affects the role and responsibility of the academy and each individual academic trying to call attention to anti-Semitism within and beyond the field of Jewish studies. Look, I, I certainly feel as an academic that it's never been more important to help students understand what a primary source is, what a fact is, um, even a word that I know was unpopular on some college campuses, but truth. And what do we mean by truth? And uh, how, um, uh, uh, how does one determine uh, issues of truth? And I certainly spend time teaching primary sources in the hope that that will inspire students to themselves independently go back to the original sources and not simply uh, swallow uh, uh, every um, uh, a secondary source that they may find on social media. Um, uh, you know, I do perhaps naively, but I do still think uh, that part of the role of university faculty is to help students understand in a wide range of areas uh, how to tell the difference uh, between uh, truth and also between what is reliable and what is unreliable, and indeed how to research questions on their own. That is something they're going to have to do their whole life. And this is part of, I think, our obligation uh, within uh, the university community. Yeah, and, and 
just se secondary sources, but it's also how to evaluate the primary sources, right? Um, again, going back to my, my book, um, the many of the stories that were transmitted in the in print were in very you know authoritative sources uh lives of saints histories by learned scholars by any you know stretch of imagination these reported historical facts so how do you convince students that no they are not historical facts you need to help them understand and this is what the ADL is trying to do, how these ideas are transmitted, how they emerge, how they change, how they are transmitted, and how they end up in authoritative sources uh, that are, you know, are, are, are uh, uh, then used uh, to replicate, the, replicate truth. So it's also that kind of critical thinking about uh, not just the, how other people are talking about the past, but also what the past has produced uh, and why. Great, thank you. We have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna move us on to the next one. Uh, and this is, this is a question about um, BDS and whether we see it as productive or not to conflate uh, or to associate BDS with anti-Semitism. There is a section, I should mention, one of the myths does address this question, but any, any comments on that? Here and someone also asked about BDS on the college campus and maybe sure. um, ways of approaching that. So uh, I'll give my quick take based on how we see it at ADL. So a few things. So I should say as context, look at it. Although it may be appropriate, let's say in a class on 19th century nationalism at Tulane, or theories of nationalism at Tulane or Fordham or Brandeis, but in this world, the one we live in today in America 2020, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. It just is. Now, again, that doesn't mean there might be ardent Jewish, you know, obs observant Jews who don't believe in the state of Israel. And there may be people of Palestinian descent or people themselves who are displaced by the creation of the modern state of Israel in 1948. But the reality is, whether by intention or by outcome, anti-Zionism, again, we see this on college campus and other places in public life, it, it, it typically triggers um, anti-Semitic sentiment, and BDS, and, and so we need to see BDS in that context. So BDS is one tactic or tool of the broader movement to delegitimize the Jewish state, not to improve it, not to reform it, but to destroy it. And again, it's not that Israel doesn't have a long litany of offenses it has committed, like every other nation state, by the way, on the planet Earth. And we can argue about how those offenses stack up relative to other countries like Iran or China or North Korea, whatever. The bottom line is the degree of animus held toward the state of Israel and the efforts to delegitimize it, to demonize, to hold double standards, it's anti-Semitism. So, and we, and it, again, trying to render the Jewish blank illegitimate is not new. It used to be done against the Jewish people. Now it's done against the Jewish state. So again, there's a history to this, and it has echoes because there are parallels throughout the last 2,000 years. With that being said, the people, the particularly young people on a college campus or others who might get involved in a BDS-related effort, they are not, not all anti-Semitic. We should recognize this. It may be that the people who developed and are the architects of the BDS movement who knew this was an effort to commit uh, a kind of, you know, um, to render the state, to undermine its moral foundations, right? Its legal basis to discredit it, to dismantle it that way rather than militarily. They may, have, they may not believe that Jews have the right to self-determination. And it may be on a BDS campaign on a college campus. We see a rally and then there are swastikas on the Jewish fraternity. There's an op-ed in the newspaper and then somebody vandalizes the hill out. Right? So oftentimes, the consequence of these campaigns can be manifestations of anti-Semitism. People hold up a sign at the rally, you know, Israel is the Nazi state. Now, with that being said, I think what we all need to recognize and the nuance of it is that while that may be true, it by intention or by outcome, it may cause anti-Semitism, but the young people holding the signs might not realize it, might not be aware. Many people think it's a social justice movement and they think not only one, but it's one that's peaceful. It's nonviolent. 
because oftentimes the BDS movement clothes itself in the kind of language and if you will, the rhetorical paraphernalia of the movement to push back on apartheid South Africa. So what I would say to you is the following. There are plenty of things wrong with the state of Israel, like there are plenty of things wrong with this country and with the French Republic and so many of the Commonwealth of Australia and so many other countries around the world. But when you, when you believe that only one country doesn't have the right, and its people, the right to self-determination, holding Jews to a different standard you hold everybody else, that is anti-Semitism, plain and simple. And to those who might say, why is every criticism of Israel considered anti-Semitic? The answer is, it's not. And if you want an example of an organization that criticizes the state of Israel and doesn't engage in anti-Semitic tropes, I would point you to this website. You should write this down, www.adl.org. And there are others, New Israel Fund, Trua, I could go on and on, but like, yes, I mean, you can criticize the state of Israel and again, not demonize it. You can suggest new policy approaches and not try to undermine its legal foundation. You can criticize its leaders and not hold all Israelis culpable for, the, for crimes. So I think Israel is a complicated issue. It's often a flashpoint, and the, but the BDS campaign, again, by intention or outcome, is deeply problematic. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I would again point interested audience members to look at the last myth listed in the resource, uh, which discusses the, you know, the myth being that anti-Zionism anti is never anti-Semitism. Right? Uh, it's explored in depth there. So the, um, another question has been posed about um, trying to understand a potential rise in anti-Semitism or visit, rise in visibility of anti-Semitism with the strong support of Israel by um, evangelical Christians. Um, and before I put, put that out there, I also wanna mention, if we don't get to your question, uh, we do save the chat. I'm sorry that we don't have time for all of them, but we will try to connect with you afterwards. Look, I think in, I mean, fully understand the question, I think there's been a tremendous transformation in evangelical attitudes toward Jews, when we look before World War II, it was very common uh, for evangelicals to be deeply involved in efforts to convert Jews uh, in what we might call supersessionism and the like. And um, uh, what is so amazing, and the Six Day War had something to do with it, uh, yeah, and, and there are individuals, as we uh, recent book showed, who devoted their lives to changing uh, the way evangelicals look at, uh, at Jews and at the state of Israel, at re-exploring biblical texts, which are tremendously important in evangelical culture. And we really can see um, uh, a move from uh, an earlier era of uh, anti-Semitism. If you look back in the records of the ADL in the 30s, you can see that uh, to a kind of philo-Semitism, uh, which, um, uh, which we see today. Uh, uh, Magda earlier pointed to the transformation of Catholicism. I think we are not always equally uh, aware of how much uh, the evangelical world has changed uh, in its attitude both towards Jews uh, and towards the state of Israel. And I would just add that I think many Jews uh, do not themselves realize how much has changed and, uh, and just like they think, oh, the Catholics have never changed, even more so, uh, they think, oh, uh, the evangelicals have never changed. It's uh, everything we knew, it's just a little hidden. Well, yeah, change is possible. I'm a historian, that's what we study. And lots of changes, I think, uh, have, um, uh, have taken place. I will say that, you know, um, Palo-Semitism was another coin of uh, uh, 
a side of also anti-Semitism. And then theological terms, the Jews have always played a role in Christian eschatology and in Christian world. So the theologically for centuries, for millennia, uh, Jews were not of interest to Christians as Jews, and, but, but Jews as converted Jews or Jews as a means to the second coming of Christ were all also interesting. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing uh, in this process uh, today, um, with, with, especially with Israel. Thank you. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, there was a question about economics. Uh, so uh, from an economic perspective, are there any uh, thoughts that you might have related to the topic of anti-Semitism in America? How do, how do economics weigh in on uh, how we're seeing anti-Semitism and how these myths potentially play out? Uh, and, and please just keep your comments as brief as possible before we wrap up. Um uh, unmute, Jonathan. Yeah. I'm reminded of a story. So one of the extremists we often pay attention to is Alex Jones. He's a well-known conspiracist who often rails against the, quote, Jewish mafia. Um, and on a show in 2017, he went off on a long diatribe about how the Jewish mafia were responsible for, uh, he, called, he called it uh, death panels and Uber, which he blamed for our current economic malaise. What does that mean? Well, he connected it to Rahm Emanuel, who was the former White House Chief of Staff, who brought in his brother, Ezekiel Emanuel, a distinguished professor at the University of Pennsylvania, to advise on Obamacare on the ACA, which he derided as death panels. And then his other brother, Ari Emanuel, who is an agent in Hollywood and was an early investor in Uber, and the largest employer of white, non-college educated men, drivers, and the fear of the automated car was roiling uh, the internet and the fringe in 2017. Look, economic displacement has always been a driver of anti-Semitism. Jews have been blamed for capitalism. Jews have been blamed for communism. Jews are literally at the same time accused of both diametrically opposed kind of economic philosophies. I don't necessarily agree with Professor Klingenstein that anti-Semitism isn't about the Jews. I think it is, but it often is rooted in uh, and it can be blamed for economic unrest or upheaval. So that's how I would approach. And so we've, uh, we've been worried at ADL for some time, as we've anticipated, like many have, an economic correction, um, you know, some kind of recessive activity, which is now taking place because of COVID, uh, that the Jews would be blamed for causing this to happen, as we saw in 2008 with the banking crisis. So we remain very vigilant to this and try to do what we can to point out that just because some bankers are Jewish doesn't mean all Jews are responsible for it, for example. But I, I would remind you that the 1920s, also known as the Roaring Twenties, saw a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism. And the 1930s, of course, the Great Depression, likewise saw a lot of anti-Semitism. So simple economic uh, interpretations of anti-Semitism uh, I think are unlikely to advance our understanding. Jews worry when uh, there is a crash because uh, uh, anti-Semites know that Jews are responsible even before the economic crash takes place. But yeah, I think yeah. it would be a mistake to imagine that in good times, no anti-Semitism at all, and in bad economic times, it rears its head. It's much more complicated than that. And some of the social changes, some of the vast cultural transformations taking place before our eyes really seem to me to be no less important in understanding uh, what is going on today, both in terms of anti-Semitism and I would insist also in terms of some of the other hatred uh, that that we see in some of the great uh, clashes uh, going on in American society. Great, thank you. Uh, I know we're just about out of time, but I would I would really like to um, express my thanks and speak on behalf of the audience and the Grand Center. It's been such a privilege uh, to speak with the three of you. It's been an enriching conversation that I hope has advanced a lot of uh, the thinking happening in the audience as well. 
Uh, again, the Grand Center is excited to, uh, to launch itself. Please check out our website, which should appear in the chat at the moment, uh, should be appearing there. And uh, remember our next event, October 14th, Dr. Pamela Nadell will come and speak about her book on American Jewish women. Uh, thank you again to the attentive audience, the great questions, the engagement, uh, and to our three distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you for having us. Thank care. you to the Grand Center. Thank, thank you, Golan. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.